to start because it's, uh, we have a presentation, which is unusual for us, but I'm glad we are. So I'm going to start uh, and uh, welcome. This is the Longmont Housing Authority Board of Commissions meeting, Tuesday, September 17th, 2024. Um, and we have a roll call. Uh, can you start? I'll just go around. <coughs> Commissioner Aaron Rodriguez. Um, Chair uh, Joe Peck. Commissioner Susie Lalo Perry. Commissioner Sean McCoy. Lauren Sully, Assistant Director. Guest Andy Schwartz. <laughs> Guest Kristen Walter. Um, Commissioner. Commissioner Marshall Martin. Molly. Molly. Roll call, Molly. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Thanks. Molly O'Donnell, Housing Director. Tracy D. Francesco, Housing and Compliance Manager. Daniels, County Supervisor. Uh, Harold Dominguez, Interim Executive Director. Karen Mara, uh, Executive Assistant. Tim Hall, Assistant City. Okay, we are waiting for two commissioners, Commissioner Shakita Yarbrough and Sh Commissioner uh, Diane Christ. Um, so we're going to go immediately into review and approval of the August 20, 2024 minutes. Can I have a motion? I move the uh, approval as presented. Second, been moved by uh, Commissioner McCoy, second by Commissioner Hidalgo Ferry. Is there any discussion about the minutes? Seeing none, let's vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? And that passes five to two with two commissioners of McCoy. No, you're here. Uh, who is missing? Yarbrough, Yarbrough, Yarbrough and Chris. Commissioners Yarbrough and Chris. Mm -hmm. Uh, we are now at public invited to be heard. Is there anybody in the public that would like to be heard? Seeing no one, uh, we'll go into our new business now, which is a special presentation that we have tonight by Annie and Millie's Place. So, um, Hmm? Yeah, we're we're going to do that. We did. I'm going fast. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. I'm not even keep it up. That's okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, do you have a presentation? She is. She's plugging it in right now. Ah, oh, yes. great. Yeah. The wife was the dean of the car, la la, I was there. Oh, really? Mm. Okay, um, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, we'll go ahead and just get started. So, um, do you prefer that I stand or sit? Whatever's comfortable. Whatever's comfortable. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, so, my name is Kristen Baltram. I'm the founder and executive director of Annie and Millie's Place. You're going to hear all about our program. I have with me my friend and my colleague, Andy Schwartz, who is with us um, to explain more about the role that he has. So, Annie and Millie's Place is a resource for people experiencing homelessness who have pets. Our mission is to keep people experiencing homelessness together with their fur family by evolving pet friendly solutions, programs, and resources. So we started the program, I really began the research in fall of 2020, and then we incorporated in uh, January of 2021. And since then, uh, well, I want to tell you a little bit about who Annie and Millie are. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> okay. So um, while we're waiting, sure. I just want to say that I met with both Andy and Kristen, mm -hmm. and we uh, they explained who it was, and I... Uh, asked them if they would present because mm -hmm. as we are building places knowing how animals mm -hmm. connect with people i think it's something that we should be, we should be thinking about going all the way all thank you thank you okay is that i do see it it's that LHA it. Just, uh, to lha There we go. There we go. You go to that third slide. Yeah. And then run from there. There's our mission. Yeah. Mission is to keep people experiencing homelessness together with their fur family by involving pet friendly solutions, programs, and resources. Next slide. So who is Annie? Annie is my sister. She's my older sister. And um, we also have our younger sister, Katie. Annie, whoop, back, back, please. 
Thank you. So that's, that's Annie and I together. That's our little sister, Katie, and that's our mom, Karen. So Annie is both a sister and a daughter. She's also the mother of Charlie, Casey, Sarah, and Sydney. And she's the grandparent of Ashlyn and Addison and Weston and Kaysen and Archer and RJ, as I remember. But this is Annie. She was the best dog mom to Millie. Annie and Millie together were living outside Louisville, Kentucky when they were evicted from their apartment in 2019. Mm -hmm. When Annie went to receive emergency overnight shelter, she went there and said, hey, I need a place to stay. Can't do that. Our family had put her up in hotels for a little while. Not sustainable. So she went to the shelter. And they said, you can come in, but your dog can't. So because Millie was Annie's one sole loyal companion, protector, provider, unconditional love, source of purpose, all the things, Annie had one choice available to her, which was to stay with Millie and sleep outside. After seven months of sleeping in various parks and ditches, Annie did find an abandoned home that she squatted in, and it was there that she died by suicide. Mm -hmm. Millie was the only one there. I'm convinced that had Millie been allowed into the shelter with Annie that first night that Annie asked mm -hmm. for help, that I would not be standing here today because Annie would still be alive, that she would have connected to the services there. But when that trust was broken at the very first question, she walked away from all of those resources. So our mission, since we have, you can go to the next slide. Um, what we've started since uh, we incorporated in January 20, of 2021 is four key programs. The first one is our outreach and supplies. That's where good Andy comes in. He's out three times a week between Longman and Boulder with a backpack full of supplies, handing people what they need and building trusted relationships with them. We also provide pop-up clinics and sponsor the cost of emergency and urgent veterinary care. We last January put 10 people in seven pets in hotels for five nights that one weekend when it was negative 40 because there was no place else to go. We did that lift in collaboration. Andy lifted that whole program with, in collaboration with the Boulder and Longmont outreach teams. And then we also coordinate temporary foster care. And that's where Andy's really going to take it and run with you and tell you more about what that program is and how it applies here to yeah. LHS. And that's sort of the tie into why we're here, uh, since most of you work with people that are now housed. So, but first, let's talk about pet ownership. Anybody here have pets or mm had -hmm. pets? Yeah. Uh, most people say hi to their pet before their partner and their kids. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's really the priority. <laughs> um, so it, it's not much different for folks staying. I'm going to focus mainly on the suites because that's your predominant PSH housing. Um, over the years, just my background, I've worked with Hope for almost seven years running their outreach program. Um, and I did get involved, obviously, in housing because that was a big part of that. Outreach was getting people into housing. Um, so I've placed people to suites, I've had clients pass away at the suites, and I've had friends um, that I've met that have lived at the suites, so pretty familiar with the way things work there. And it is great, because I do see people with pets there, um, they take them outside, you can see that they actually congregate together. So having that pet does a couple of things for everybody, um, and it's great that you allow them, so many other programs don't. It brings this sort of physical comfort to people, it definitely brings a mental stress reliever to people, and it builds some community around them. So there's a lot of advantages to people having pets. The one thing, you know, generally, we looked at a lot of studies, and that increase in happiness really ranges anywhere from what I've seen from 40 to 70%. So I didn't want to just throw a random number up there because mm -hmm. it's just so many different studies. But it can be, it's very obvious that people that have pets have a lot much better mental status about how they feel, they don't feel as lonely, and it's my belief everybody needs somebody, to, wants to take care of something and love something, and that pet provides that that essential need. Um, so if people want studies, we can help. Yeah, we're more than happy to provide any information. Yeah. So this is what we we were able to help uh, LHA and your clients earlier this year, I think it was probably in May, I think February, I think February. We had a vaccine clinic at the suites. Uh, we heard there were about 20 animals there unvaccinated, which A, is not good for the animals, but we also, I believe that is a, a violation of LHA policy. So we were able to get 16 of those pets vaccinated. We were able to provide some grooming and some nail care and just other basic checkups on, on the pets that live there. Um, we did, I don't know how many, but we were able to provide some spay neuter vouchers for some of the dogs that were not um, spayed and neutered. We work predominantly with dogs and cats. 
Um, in my five months now, I think, mm -hmm. with Annie and Millie's, I've also had one snake as a client. So. <laughs> <laughs> I've also had, yeah, mm -hmm. a ferrets or ferret servals rats. Yeah. So if somebody has sort of a more exotic pet, they're not excluded. It's just not what we focus mm -hmm. on, yeah. but obviously we can still try to help. We are able to help with medical emergencies. Typically, we find medical emergencies run us between $250 and $350 per emergency. Um, that is a case-by-case -case basis. If it is palliative care or anything long-term, at, at this point, we're just not able to cover that. I mean, budget comes into play. I'm sure everybody here understands budget constraints. Um, and we do provide everyday needs. I'm out there with food, leashes, harnesses. I'm not out there with cat litter, mainly because of weight. But we do have it if somebody has a cat. Especially your local, we'd be able to maybe make an arrangement where we have maybe a monthly you know, something monthly where people can come get, come get supplies. We do help with ESA certification. Uh, we do not right now have a lot with CSA certification, but if somebody really needed it, we'd figure it out. So, you know, we're really, we're, we're flexible and able to help uh, wherever it is needed. We we'll try to, at least. What's the difference? ESA is? ESA is the emotional support animal that just takes one meeting with a the therapist to sign that letter. The certified service animal are the ones that usually provide some sort of medical oh, assistance, exactly. and they're highly trained animals. It's very expensive. Yeah, right. So, and this is where I think we're going to be able to, over the net, over time, be able to really help um, LHA out the most. We are building our foster program. That is something we're really hoping to have very robust by the end of the year. Um, so, we want to have a large pool of fosters that we have vetted. Ideally, ten dog, five cat fosters. Um, so. That really, clients come in, and we know this, they come in with medical problems, they come in with substance problems, they come in sometimes with incarceration that still needs to happen. But they won't do these things if they can't get their pet taken care of. Mm -hmm. it's, it becomes a barrier for them. It should not become a barrier. So we're looking to bridge that gap so people can take care of what they need to. I mean, I've seen simple leg problems turn into double amputations, and there was just no reason for that to happen. So we wanna, we will have a foster program. I'd like to work with case managers at LHA for that instead of clients directly. I'm not against working with clients directly, but you know your clients best and, and you have the trust. So that, that will, I think, work towards a quicker outcome. And we would then match the pet to the best foster situation. One of the reasons we want a pool of fosters is because <coughs> there's different situations. If, you know, if the foster is you know, a 72 year old, man or woman, they can't take care of two young pit bulls. It's oh, just not going to yeah. work. <laughs> so, but a nine-year-old chihuahua is perfect. perfect. <laughs> so we want to have good matches between the fosters and, and the dogs. Um, the platform we're going to be using will allow anonymous communication between the foster and the client. Um, it will be completely anonymous for protection of both. The foster is not going to know why the client needs a foster. Um, the f and same with the clients, not going to know where their animal is. But there will be anonymous communication. And we, we, can we can monitor that communication mm -hmm. to make sure that there's nothing really inappropriate going on and, and take control if we need to. Mm -hmm. So we're very excited about that. And I really think that's where the biggest, where we really connect to what, you know, um, is happening in the suites. Um, I'm sure we'll have something similar at Zinnia. And as our program grows, we'd really like to see this you know, grow into other housing structures as well. And so I don't want to be limited here, but it's a good place to start. So co-sheltering is really our main goal, where people and their animal companion would be able to get that emergency overnight shelter together. There are a few models that are currently popped up since 2022 here in Colorado. Like I said, we started our work in 2021. A couple of models around uh, Colorado, Colorado have started, as well as across the nation that we're connected to through a collaborative. I've toured many of them and am in regular conversation with many of the leaders of those organizations. So I have best practices to offer our community, including the one in Grand Junction that's the Pallet House model, which works fabulously. It's our favorite model of all of them. And um, it's really possible to make that happen, especially since we know organizations are already using them. And so we can just pull some of that together. We don't need to reinvent the wheel for that. So there's some things that are happening. Our biggest goal, you can put the next slide, 
is really just to be in partnership with our community, to fill the gaps and support what's already happening. We don't want to duplicate anything. We just want to support and expand all of you who are already doing such great work in our community. So we're here to be a resource for you. Thank you for letting us come and spend a few minutes of our yeah. time, your time with us. We appreciate it. Thank you for the invitation. Do you have any questions for us right now? Do you want to tell them about uh, your upcoming, uh, I don't even know what to call it. You, you set up your pellet or your, your my party, my thank you, my yeah. pet charrette. Yeah. If you're familiar, so we don't have a date set on the calendar, we're doing some negotiating <laughs> with the space that we want to use. But if you're familiar with the term charrette, it's where stakeholders come together to really talk about and solve a problem. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to um, take one of our empty spaces here in Longmont, there's plenty of, and prop it out as if it was a co-shelter space. And then we're going to invite leaders like you and other members of our community and our large partners across the nation, have them come, and then you'll each be given uh, different colored post-it notes to write what you love about it, what your concerns are, and maybe some questions that you have. So we're really hoping to engage the entire community and helping us think through this pro problem with no risk, because we're not saying we're buying that particular building, we don't have to worry about NIMBYs yet. We're not saying we're totally going to do this. We're saying we need to hear from our community first about what this process looks like mm -hmm. and what our uh, joys and concerns are about okay. this program. Thank, Thank you. you. So you'll hear from us as soon okay. as we get that okay. date set. You're getting an invitation. <laughs> yes. Great. Great. Any other questions, comments? How long have we been collaborating, LHA, or has it started, started yet? We just part, started. This is part of initiating the conversation with the board. Okay. Uh, they started doing the, vac the vaccines. Uh -huh. um, and I just think operationally, what is it that you're looking for from the housing authority? This is basically right now, tonight, is about introducing ourselves, our program, and our resources, okay. and to be able to connect with you about what are your needs. If we need to have a second follow-up conversation and maybe a smaller meeting with the task force, we want to hear what it is you would need from us and help us determine how do we grow in the future. So this is just a chance to really introduce ourselves at this point. Yeah, and I think the real goal, I mean, you know, we do want to help everybody get housed and coached out there, but we also want to have housing retention numbers much stronger. We want people, once they're housed, to thrive and, and succeed and not end up back out of the streets. That's where the overlap, I think. Mean, yeah. Do you have a website that we can visit too? Mm -hmm. Sure. I have my business card, which I'll be here. I have my sticker. Just sticker all my, like, pleasant yeah. things. And, and, and not to go, I mean, obviously we have to go here. Are you looking for a financial contribution or? That would be a conversation that I think we could have. If the city was going to re rely on this, I think this is the right, uh, yes, if you want to pass yeah. these around or some of yours around. Um, the financial would really depend on what the, what the city need from us and what are we able to support. Right now, about 20% of our budget is coming from grants, and then the other 80% is coming from individual donors. Yeah. So we do not have a large budget at this point. Most of our, uh, I would say probably about 70% of our budget is in our program, because that also includes Andy. Andy is our program and his outreach and mm -hmm. everything that's involved in having an employee <laughs> is on there as well. So as we're building, that's where the majority of our funds go. So if we're going to expand our programming, we would need some financial support, but we can talk about what that looks like and what per, like how that plays out. So for, for the commissioners, more from an operational perspective, um, this, is, this is something that we've run into in terms of challenges. Um, in terms of how often we need this, it's hard yeah. to say, yeah. mm -hmm. but it, it is not uncommon for us, and, and I've mentioned this I think before to Andy, is you know when we look at permanent supportive housing, within our housing structures, we do have individuals who have fallen under permanent supportive that may be in a 30% HMI unit mm -hmm. somewhere else, and where it will tend to show itself is in medical emergencies. Mm -hmm. um, I personally dealt with a situation where someone was having um, really low blood sugar and we called the ambulance and the next thing you know we realized we can't pat. Mm -hmm. And then trying to catch in to at least get some verbal permission to get in and have somebody take possession of the pet. And so these are real yes. issues yeah. that, yes. that, that we deal with with our tenants. And so I think um, 
from an operational perspective, there is a need <coughs> to figure out some type of relationship. Mm -hmm. so. A quick, I don't know, we don't have a name for it yet, but crisis fostering. Mm -hmm. the, like somebody who's living outside mm -hmm. gets taken to jail and has a pet. I haven't figured out how that's exactly going to work, but that's where I would put something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't have a, a, a very, name yeah, for it. The very, the very first uh, foster that we had was somebody who we built a relationship with through a clinic. He was taken to jail. Um, when when a pet owner goes to jail, then their pet is not with their owner, and therefore it's stray. So he had four days to figure out who was going to get his dog while he's in jail. Mm -hmm. So um, it's really hard to figure. Yeah. Like to me, that's a justice issue. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, but he there was the uh, arresting officer who was very nice and allowed him a phone call that he made to me and um, called the, he was, the dog was actually at Larimer Humane Society, and gave me permission to pick the dog up. I then picked the dog up and then um, brought the dog into foster and then they were reunified um, when he got out just four days later. Okay. But he yeah. would have lost his pet. That is a look we'd like to see. It, it probably would involve working with the Humane Society, mm -hmm. public safety, I think there'd be multiple yeah. avenues. Yeah, multi yeah. Mm -hmm. sure. And we're going to have the same problem in Boulder. I mean, no matter if it's uh, like a similar process across from both the, townships. But from a landlord standpoint, when we have someone approved, because we're technically a pet free communities, except for at Hearthstone Lodge, because they're under a lot of health pets. But when we have emotional support animals or um, other uh, service animals approved, we usually have them fill out information so that there is a designated alternate caretaker yes. within mm -hmm. the community or somewhere. Um, but that's not always a given. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't always get updated, so having having an optional foster mm -hmm. situation mm -hmm. would be good. Yeah, where your resource as well as the client mm -hmm. themselves. Because yep. if, the, if the designated caretaker says, I can't watch this dog for a month, mm -hmm. so what are we going to do? Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and this will tie into our enabling caring community. So, you know, I think we talked to you all that Salesforce actually had the platform. At the time we've been working over here, they built it. So we'll have a situation that we can communicate with each other internally, um, and even public safety can communicate in that. And so in terms of the right uh, permissions, we want to test this within our housing authority uh, tenants mm -hmm. so that they create a, they will have the release form mm -hmm. and we can ask questions like if this then this and so there may be some options to to look at that so um, if the commission's interested in this we can definitely continue conversations mm -hmm. yeah. from yeah, an yeah. operational perspective mm -hmm. yeah it's important to be a part of it yeah and then even looking at the neighborhood so when you were talking about the humane society and public safety but also our neighborhood impact teams as yep. they come across or looking to i'm thinking of weather you know yes. some yes. crisis yes. or a health somebody's having a health concern that our public safety then can connect with you in the event that they have a dog mm -hmm. or a cat <laughs> um, or a cat, but yeah yeah love to be part of all those conversations okay. and help them to address the issues Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you guys. Yeah, feel free to reach out with any other questions. Okay. okay. We're available. Yeah, we're available. Yeah. Yeah, we're yeah. Awesome. Thank Wonderful. Thanks. Enjoy the rest of your meeting and your yeah. evening. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Oh. Yeah. Oh, no. Good to see you. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. So um, for the record, I'd like to say that the commissioners, Diane Chris and Katie Yarbrough, have entered the meeting. We're going to move on now to, uh, we have a resolution, LHA 2024-18, uh, approved revised suite supportive housing and selection plan. And is this, turn it over to Molly. Mm -hmm. Molly, thank, thank you. you. Commissioners, um, so we've talked about this one a few times. We introduced it back in, in the spring, I think in May, um, about how we were working uh, through the DINIA tenant selection plan process and the suites revisions to the tenant selection plan at the same time. Um, DINIA has been adopted, the LA Attorney General plan has been updated and adopted, and we finally did get DOH confirmation that the edits that we made were acceptable for the suites. Um, and so the suites is now ready to get adopted. 
Uh, we've been implementing the new tenant selection plan as far as it um, relates to pulling from the local case conferencing, the coordinated entry program, rather than the state's one home list. We've been doing that even um, without DOH's formal sign off on this tenant selection plan because that is the direction that they gave us. Um, but otherwise, it does do a lot of cleanup items as well, which we went over in more depth here in the spring, and I won't repeat unless anyone has questions. Um, but it just kind of modernizes it, makes it much more clear, and distinguishes it from our general tenant selection that's used in other properties. So I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone may have. Commissioner, do you have any questions for Molly? Seeing none, then we need a motion to uh, approve the revised. I move resolution uh, LHA 2024-18. Second. Been moved by Commissioner McCoy, second by Commissioner Yarbrough. Uh, any discussion? Seeing no one else vote, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Marcia, can you hear us? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're voting on this resolution. Do you accept it? I didn't hear you. Oh, I didn't hear anybody vote. Sorry. Oh, oh we all said aye. All those yeah. in favor say aye. 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 Okay. <laughs> all those opposed. That passes unanimously. Uh, we're going to move on to the transfer status uh, update resolution LHA 2024-19. Is this you, Molly, again? Yes, it is. Okay. Okay, so uh, we've been talking about this one for several years. Um, when the city and the LHA first came under the same umbrella in 2020, one of the first things that was done is we brought in a special counsel to check out um, the assets that LHDC held as the general partner in the tax credit partnerships um, and determine at that time, because LHDC was kind of on a, a wind down track, because LHA at the time that it um, partnered with the city was not really picking up new developments and that's really what LHDC's main role was at the time. Um, and so special counsel did say that it would be advantageous to transfer the general partner interest from LHDC to LHA and the several properties that um, that they have their name. Those include Fall River, Spring Creek, Carstone Lodge, and Chrisman One. Um, so we determined that Carson and Lodge will be taken care of with when we exit the 202 program, which is in our in our development project pipeline for the next couple of years. Um, Fall River, we already went through and determined that it was not possible to remove LHDC because it needed to have a 501c3 nonprofit involved in the ownership structure, and we didn't have an alternative to swap them out with. So they're going to hang on for that. And then Spring Creek and Christmas One is what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, while in those several years that we were working on this, uh, we have been continuing to work with LHDC. They've continued to support our development projects, including Ascent and Village on Main. And um, they, are, they are still a three-person board. That was one challenge several years ago, was recruiting new board members. They are still interested in supporting LHA. And we have determined that having a 501c3 nonprofit arm attached to LHA is very advantageous, not only on the development side, but the, to be able to accept donations. Um, and, and that is something that we'd like to broaden and expand in the future, that role. So they're with us, LHDC is with us for the long haul, um, specifically to play that nonprofit role and for sure for Fall River. Um, so the first resolution we have here this is the transfer of the general partner interest for Spring Creek Apartments from LHDC to LHA. Um, your, your board and the LHDC board gave us direction to go ahead and move forward with this one. Um, it was a relatively simple process and transaction. It just took some time to get the consent that we needed from the investor and um, the banks and DOH, all who put money in and have loans into the deal. Um, so this is the third of the five. This is the first one going forward. Um, three total will go forward in time. <coughs> so, um, really, this just and swaps out LHDC as the general partner with LHA because LHA still manages all, both the financials and, and whatever um, 
uh, debt repayment, et cetera, that the, that the projects have, it won't really change anything on the ground. It might just be a change in accounts, but Kendra can always pipe in and tell me um, more specifics. But it really won't be a, a major change to how we do our daily business. But on paper, we will be holding the loans and the guarantee um, and still running the property as is normally at the site with really no difference. Okay. Kendra, is there anything on the accounting side that we should specify on that? Well, I was pulling up other information, so like... You guys are <laughs> way too much fun up there. I'm going to ask you to do the report. I don't know. Cat videos? Cat videos? Cat videos? What are we doing over there? Are we talking about the video? No. 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 Oh, yes, yes. Yes. So, <laughs> so with that transfer, yes, most of the loans would then also transfer to the LHA side. So, yeah. Which is still Kendra. <laughs> so we have, um, and Diana, we've been talking about LHDC for a couple of years, actually. Do you have, do you have any questions if you, uh, about what it is? Or I do have questions. It? Well, go ahead and ask. <laughs> so I hear that the advantages are, are that LHDC has the um, charitable um, organization. But LHA is managing the debt and then within with the transfer be holding the loans as well. So are there any other advantages to transferring these assets? I'm looking at I'm looking at well, on which side? On yeah, LHA's yeah. side because so kind of so I'm gonna rewind it a little bit. One of the things we were looking at is that LHTC had uh, funding that we were going to transfer over into the As we were working through that, you know, what we also realized is, A, there's properties where we can't do it because of the nonprofit status. Um, we know we need a donation arm um, in with the work that we're doing. Um, and so B, I think from a control standpoint, when, when we look at it, it's easier with Spring Creek when they get to this point for us just to manage it versus having these two ancillary units that are in play. There's also tax things that will creep up with LHDC occasionally. Um, I just think generally it's easier to operate it when it's on LHA's books. Now, part of why, and Molly helped me with this because I'm going back a few years in memory, Part of why LHDC was created, because when, that, when the housing authority structure was created many, many years ago, there were some limitations in terms of whether or not housing authorities could actually develop properties. And in the case of Longmont, they didn't want the housing authority to develop properties. Mm -hmm. So they created the Longmont Housing Development Corporation to fulfill that gap in this. Mm -hmm. Those limitations no longer exist. And so that's why you're seeing the housing authority um, being front and center in the development of some of these projects. Mm -hmm. um, it is, they do have funding that we can bring in to other development agreements. So in addition to sitting on the executive director of this, I'm also the interim executive director of the LHDC or doing the work for them at the same time. So when we're looking at development projects and they have money in the bank. We've, we've run loans in and out from LHDC, so we're not taking money from LHA or from the affordable housing fund. So on the front end of the projects, that loan us a half a million dollars for pre-development costs. We then pay them back the half a million dollars on the closing of the project. Mm -hmm. So we're not tapping the LHA general fund balance or we're not tapping the affordable housing funds within the city. So it's essentially another financing arm for what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Where does the LHDC get their money? Is it from private donors or is it just yeah. without government? Okay. At the moment, they don't get any money. <laughs> they were getting the developer fees. Um, when the projects happened, they were getting the developer fees. Um, and then there was kind of an agreement to pay LHA a particular corporate fee because they were the ones actually administering most of the work that went into those developments. 
Um, but now we're kind of switching gears with LHDC because they are a true tax exempt title and mm -hmm. see to do that to use that for more residential um, services. So for example, the contract for VIA is with LHDC um, and LHDC VIA provides transportation services to our property. So that's one type of service now that LHDC does. We haven't tapped into the other resources that it could probably do, um, but LHDC is kind of an entity that uh, the money received really needs to come from more nonprofit and city organizations because it is a 5013C. Um, it can give private donations, but you have to pass, to, uh, pass a test to make sure that all your private is not um, overstepping the bounds mm -hmm. um, and you lose your tax exempt status. So um, that's kind of where LHDC is right now. So they have a bunch of investments that came either through develop developer fees in the past um, and or, um, you know, Spring Creek actually paid LHDC quite a bit of money for their land loan because they're actually one of the best properties in, in, a, in this situation because they got a lot of DR funds mm -hmm. um, and they don't have a lot of the other funding. They didn't have a mortgage. Their mortgage is the DR funds, which is, you know, $25,000 um, every year. And Spring Creek actually pays that to LHDC. So they're kind of in the best financial position because they don't have the huge mortgage that most of the others do. Now, the other reason we kind of talked about keeping them in play is for a while you had community housing development organizations or shows. There was a time when they were really involved and then it just sort of went where they're not in play as much. We're starting to see that that may be a vehicle that we need to see used down the road because you're seeing a resurgence in how folks utilize Chodos. And so that was the other reason because we, they were a Chodo at one point and they chose not to be. So we could actually convert it back into it if we needed to for a project. So the disadvantage is that when you take these assets, you're also taking the loans, the debt along with it. Is that kind of putting them together in one pot instead of keeping it separate? Is that what I'm hearing? We would take on, um, yeah, so the debt that LHTC has is the loan to the OH. Um, and what comes in, Spring Creek pays the interest on that loan, but with the OH, there is no interest. So what they pay is just fully paying down the loan, whereas Spring Creek is accumulating interest um, on that loan that would be due back or written off if, you know, once they went through resignation, that, that tends to happen. Um, the concern is, is that, doesn't that kind of break down the line between where does it go? Does it go to LHGC or does it go to LHL? Yeah. It seems like the accounting should be a little funny up there. It seems like the accounting might get a little muddy having that both sides of LHA. So. Well, Spring Creek's money is due back to LHDC. So uh, all of it's on LHDC's books. It would just be switching to LHA. There's loans that LHDC is making the project that will be paid back, <coughs> but there's no. LHDC has Project. Saying, LHDC know. itself hasn't taken on any debt for these projects. It's the project has taken on debt and has loaned money into it, just in the same structure that LHA does into our projects. But we loan money into the project itself. <coughs> so we will be taking on those loans. LHA will be taking on those loans. We will pass that resolution tonight. But there is a guarantee that goes with that. Um, where there is some, some risk from the uh, legal guarantee for the loans that the project made because the LHDC sponsors the project and guarantee for the project. So that, that risk will come over to LHA. Um, the so payments from all those loans and all the responsibility for holding the guarantee on the project, it's still wrapped up in the property. The property still pays its own way. It's just either in this case, Currently, LHDC is responsible for paying them, and through our management fee, we um, 
exercise it on our behalf and make whatever payments are necessary and manage all the financials of the property. Um, and so it's really, it's actually eliminating an extra step when it comes to the day-to-day -day business. It does move the risk, which Tim, I would say is low on this property. <laughs> it's been stabilized for some time um, uh, to LHA. However, even if it was with LHDC, if there was a problem, LHA would be heavily involved. So yeah, we're so sort of embedded in the risk anyway because you have the operations and maintenance on the facility, so it's not the only risk that we're absorbing is is really facility related. But yet, yeah, because we're the only we're the operating and maintenance entity, we still have to make sure that the building's operational. So I would argue I don't think we're absorbing any more risk because mm -hmm. we're the ones charged with making sure the building is in good shape. Yeah. That's true. And then yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, which is a good the, the yeah. positive yeah. side. Well, Part of it. Yeah. 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 So Diane Commissioner Chris. Um, because we still have a full packet, um, yeah. perhaps you can have a one on one with either Tim or Harold or Well I just Molly. have one other question oh, which well. is is the is it in a cash positive is it in a cash positive situation? And I mean, marginally yeah. so, marginally so. How would you? Um, I would say positively so because they pay, you know, a really good chunk back to LHDC, about two hundred thousand dollars because they had, they had cash surplus. Okay. Um, so yeah. Great. So we do need to move resolution 2024-19. I'll move resolution LHA 2024-19. Second. It's been moved by Commissioner Hidalgo Fearing, uh, seconded by Commissioner McCoy. All those in favor? Let's aye. say aye. 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 All those opposed? <clears throat> that passes unanimously. And now we're going to go on to Crispin 1. Or did you cover that, Molly? I, I'm just, it's just a brief statement. Okay. Um, that is the last one to move, well, other than the Hearthstone and Lodge, which will essentially take care of themselves. Christman 1, we were directed to go ahead and move forward with that. However, uh, in approximately 2028, when we take over Christman 1 and 2 um, from MGL, we'd have to do essentially the same thing anyway. So um, it was advantageous for many reasons to just hold until about 2028 and take care of it all at once. Um, so if the commissioners would like us to go ahead and change that direction, we can. Um, but the recommendation really is just to hold until 2028 so we don't have to just incur attorney fees early when we're going to have to anyways. Okay. So you just need direction, not necessarily a motion. So, um, yes. Okay, great. Uh, I personally say mm -hmm. keep on the path you're going yeah, yeah, because yeah. It, it's working. You want to change it? Yeah. Let's yeah, just say it's just because. Yeah. Well, be clear. What when LHDC wanted to dissolve? Yes. We had to untangle. Right. They're now not wanting to dissolve. They're engaged with us in what we're doing. So we don't have to untangle, therefore we don't want to untangle it until we transfer it to avoid a duplication of legal fees. Okay. That's just, that's the same situation. Saving money. Um, so uh, all, all of you who agree that we should just keep on the path for going with the commissioners, can we just raise your hands? Yes. Okay, that's the direction. Keep on, keep it on. Housing <laughs> choice uh, voucher program. That's me. Yep. Resolution LHA 2024-20, approved housing choice voucher five-year administration plan. So HUD requires um, us to do a, a five-year plan, and it only has to do with the housing choice voucher program. And in this plan, we set out goals, mm -hmm. and then um, report on our achievement from the previous five-year goals. Um, it really hasn't changed very much from last year. It's, you know, we'll, we'll still go out for as much funding as we can if it's available. Um, we will continue to, to do what we're doing now. Um, for, we also put in here that 
any time there is an opportunity to put project-based vouchers onto a project that makes sense, that we would do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, it just um, reports back on what we've accomplished from last year, which we accomplished everything we said we were going to, except we didn't have anything to really apply for. We did get five new vouchers, but other than that, that was all really great. So the plan is staying pretty much the same. Okay. So, yeah. So I have a question. Um, I know in the in the plan um, it stated. I know towards the end. I know it, you all said that this will be considered as a public uh, notice. Today's meeting, right? Uh -huh. Would a do public you, hearing. Public hearing. Yeah. So, do you also like post these up on in the properties as well? Like the full no, plan, to, so that if anyone disagree with the plan, that they, so that you can have those comments, because I think it's posted online. Yeah, it was on it was on our website. Um, it doesn't require. I under the like the CDBG program. There's there's really a lot of um, regulations on um, public participation. This doesn't require it to be put in the paper. Um, that's the only thing that we just didn't do other than. Uh, but I was just asking if you posted. It. It's on, on our property. website. Mm -hmm. But you don't put them out and like post it somewhere where somebody want to read it just right there. It may not, no, because they may not have. Yeah, because it's the voucher working. program, those are okay. scattered. Okay. Um, so it's kind of hard to just to, to um, find those people. Mm -hmm. The only thing that we could do next year is do a mash the mailing. Um, with a little notice that that this is coming up, and um, if they wanted to comment, that they could find it on our website. I wouldn't, I wouldn't. Yeah, no, I won't do. But that might be a possibility right. next next I, year. I would like that. Okay. That would make me happy. Yeah, Her. that probably make me happy. <laughs> Her. <That's good>. Her. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Are there any questions about uh, 2024, 20? Any other comments? Just like comment. Say, all right, seeing that, uh, I need a motion then. I move uh, LHA, uh, resolution LHA 2024 20, 20. 20. Second. Second. It's been moved by Commissioner McCoy, seconded by Commissioner Yarbrough. Marsha, I, I heard her just because she's sitting next to me. Um, all those uh, in favor say aye. Or, okay. Aye. 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 That was <coughs> unanimously approved. Now, are the so are the voucher funding updates the same as what you just gave us? Okay, then we're at the voucher oh, that's, <coughs> that's you. That's you. Voucher funding updates. So, <coughs> there's really not an update right now, other than we have put the information in for the shortfall funding that we talked to you all about at the last meeting. Um, Kendra is keen to see if they have any information for us. We still haven't heard from them, but we did get a new HUD staff person that reached out to us for a meeting so we could just get together and talk to each other. So I think they're working to schedule that soon, and I think in that meeting we'll be able to have more information. We have, it's Thursday. We have it scheduled for Thursday. Thursday. Okay. So there you go. Is that is that at the state on the state level or the federal level? Federal, federal level. Okay. So we're in the system for the shortfall funding. We're just now wanting to see where we are and what we're going to get. So if we get anything. We will. We will. Positive thinking. Positive yes. thinking. Mm -hmm. Okay, you don't need anything from us on that. It was just an update. So we're going to go to interim executive director report. Yeah, based on time, um, so now I'm going to jump in on this. So I think um, you want to do a quick update on Zinnia, where we are on leasing? Yeah, we're leasing. We're making great progress. They plan on move-ins um, at the beginning of October. And the 
entire team all together, which also includes MHP, um, All Roads, which was Boulder Shelter, and the developer group are really on a good stride and uh, got a good system in place to get it done. So the thing about this project that we're going to be watching pretty close because Sarah's also, Sarah Arnie's working with um, Boulder, because Boulder Police have somewhat of a similar relationship, is one of the unique things that, that they did at Bluebird and are going to do here, and, and frankly it's one of the challenges on housing retention, is they're, one of the rules in place on Zinnia is that the first six months that you're living there, you can't have a visitor. Oh. Oh. Um, and, and we're going to be watching that pretty close because one of the challenges that we see in permanent supportive housing is in housing retention is that for six months is pivotal in terms of stabilizing and a lot of times what we've seen historically is when we move someone in within the first six months and I don't know if you've seen it recently more. But we have new tenants at the suites sneaking people in and out. So they start sneaking people in and out. Um, it, you know, we've had a couple instances where they'll bring their friends in. One of the highest meth tests that we've turned occurred within less than a month of somebody moving into the facility. And so mm -hmm. what we're hearing is that that's working really well at Bluebird. So we're going to watch Zinnia and how that works. We may actually want to come back with some adjustments to the suites and replicate that there because that's really that first six months and stabilizing people is probably the most critical that we have. So that was just a piece I wanted to touch on here. Um, I literally just signed the closing documents on Ascent um, about an hour and a half ago. Oh, so awesome. they'll be getting those in to close. What day is that going to close? 25th. The 25th. So that'll be closing and they literally will probably go under construction in the next couple of days after closing. They're probably, mo I mean, yeah, I think they're, they're already there. Are they already <laughs> there? Yeah. I mean, we mobilize, you mobilize fast once you close because you don't want to continue accruing interest on the loans. So that's good news. So all of that signed and that'll be done this week. Um, that's the last big project that we have going forward right now. Um, I do want to talk to you about a couple of things. Kendra, can you bring up the fund balance sheet? So we're going to be bringing you the budget in October. Um, I wanted to throw something out to you all because one of the things that we're starting to see, so when you look at what we're dealing with, um, we have the lease indication we just looked through in Village on Maine. We're bringing Zinnia on, and then we have um, Ascent coming online. And and so when we look at this, there's there's a lot of workload that's, that's coming into play. So as she zooms in on this, this is the fund balance that we created to show you what we were looking at in terms of how we were managing fund balance over time and how that was working into uh, the operational component of the Housing Authority General Fund. Now, what, what, was, what we pointed out when we did this the last time is that it, on the Housing Authority side, it's a little bit different than the city side in that you have, we have been and they have been living off of development fees as they've been coming into the system. What we talk about is we want to wean ourselves off of just solely relying on the development fees. And so for 2025 budget coming in, we projected that we were going to need a transfer from the fund balance of $1.1 million. What you're actually seeing in there is we think, and that was as of a day, ago, a day or two ago, we think we're only going to have to transfer $943,000 out of that into the operating fund for the housing authority, which is a success in that we're not having to transfer as much out of the fund balance as we thought we were going to do. So when we talk about it, we talk about the fact that what, what I'm watching is this number here because it's indicating when we need to have the next project coming in so you can get those revenues into the fund balance. 
so that you can continue that in the future. So if you kind of look here, um, but actually the adjusted fund balance, this is from Ascent, where we're adding those revenues into that stream. So then we look at the adjusted fund balance. So what it's telling me is right in here, we need to have another project come forward in order to rebuild those fund balances. And working with Kendra, um, so what we did is, um, there, one of the things we've never had is reserve in our fund balance um, in terms of the three month operating reserve or 22%. So we've allocated that operating reserve here. So that's essentially becomes a restricted fund balance that we only use in cases of emergencies. Um, when we bring you the budget, I'm gonna add another two months into that. And so um, essentially what we'll have is a five month fund balance and then this just becomes the unrestricted fund balance that we have for the housing authority. Um, which, if you remember a few years ago, this is a much different picture financially different. than what we're dealing with. So, um, a couple of things that we built, can you scroll down? So what we've also done is, um, you can see where I'm setting some targets that are highlighted in yellow in terms of, of setting goals, in terms of continuing to reduce the drawdown on fund balance over time. Now, I will tell you this is, these are pretty significant adjustments for a, a budget that's a million dollars. But in a fund balance, it's under a million, but you can see what it's, how it's shifting that fund balance over time. Um, development will come into it in terms of the ongoing revenue piece. The reason why I'm talking to you about this is in the budget for next year, we're proposing an additional maintenance position and we're proposing an additional accounting position because of workload. So that's within the 943. So if you think about it, we're adding two positions, we're reducing the transfer, what we projected, so that's a fairly significant swing financially, but we're overwhelmed in work. And um, overwhelmed to the point we need immediate relief. So I asked Kendra to look at, well, what would it cost if we wanted to try to go ahead and hire the maintenance position and the accounting position now um, so we can get it on board? And if we did that in, you know, soon we can get a start date in November, that's $42,000. I'm not asking for a decision now, I'm just wanting you all to think about that because when we present the budget, that's going to be a question that we're going to ask you is to say, can we open up those two positions to get them hired sooner rather than later? Worst case, it would draw an additional $42,000 down. Um, probably realistically, it would be half of that because it would only be one month. But this is a preview of the budget and what we're, we're trying to accomplish. Well, personally, I would like to see those positions hired before you start another project because yeah. you're just working too hard to do <laughs> I guess. Well, and for context, we're down to maintenance people right now. Yeah. Oh, you are oh. already. Wow. Yeah, we have one on FMLA mm -hmm. and, and caregiver leave, and then mm -hmm. um, another one we're dealing with. So, um, so yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting time period. But. So we'll talk about, I'm not asking for a decision, I just wanted to kind of put that in your mind so we can talk about it because we will be asking for a direction moving forward. The other thing in this is, do I think those yellow numbers are realistic? Absolutely, I think they're realistic. What we're talking about is re-envisioning how we do projects. And so one of the things that Lauren's informed us about uh, Boulder Housing Partners is they actually do projects where they intermingle market rate and with affordable. So if you remember when we talked about attainable housing on the rental side and affordable, this is where we were talking to you all about if we can get a direct allocation out of the 1B funds. Mm -hmm. What it does is it lets us look at a different financing model that when you bring the attainable housing units in, you actually spend more cash out. 
And so if we can get one or two projects like that, it could, within a seven year period, set the stage to be where we're cash flow positive over time. And so we will be talking to you all about that over the next few months. Isn't that ICO anyway? I mean, it is. Yeah, it is ICO. And, um, but it, we're waiting on a decision from the county in terms of the 1B funding because we really need that dedicated funding to take to solve the debt mm -hmm. uh, ratio issue. Although our fund balances, if we wanted to be uber aggressive, probably can solve that now. But we don't want to do that. But we don't want to do that. Because if you look at it and you said if we needed to move to hit a 1.25 or 1.3 when you're using the debt, you know, that's between a million and a million and a half. And so if you look at let me scroll up. If you look at that number, uh, the adjusted ending fund balance, we're really close to that. But that's too much risk to absorb. Your margins become too tight in terms of doing that. So we really need that direct allocation to help bridge it. Did you say 42,000? Mm -hmm. For the two yeah. positions for two months. <coughs> that's a fully loaded cost. Mm -hmm. For 2024, the others will be built into the It's 2025 year. Mm -hmm. It's not an accountant doing uh, maintenance work, too. I'm just <laughs> no, it's a, it's a maintenance. <laughs> it, it is a maintenance technician and an accountant. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's two positions. For two months. Mm -hmm. For two months. Yeah. That's it. That's all you got? Yeah. Uh, are we going to do occupancy and property updates? It's so far. That's it. Okay. Okay. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Second. Okay, can okay. you move by Commissioner McCoy, seconded by Commissioner Chris, to adjourn all those in favor? Aye. All those opposed?